Good morning, everybody. A couple of announcements here. Uh, Monty Schrader is going to be ordained July 22nd. There's a reception at the Grange Hall afterwards at 3 o'clock with food. And so there's an RSVP sheet on the bulletin board outside the restrooms. Please sign up by July 16th. That's two weeks from today. Uh, also, Z World is happening. As you know, postcards are back to the church. Invite people to come and they can register online as well. And finally, the uh, newsletter for the month is on the back of the church, or you can sign up online, get it online, or it's sent to you through Realm. So if you're interested in any of those things, uh, take advantage of them. But we're thankful you're here. We're thankful you're joining us online. It's a wonderful day to be alive, isn't it? Let's open with prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your blessings in our lives. Thank you for the chance to come here and worship you. We can think back to the activities of this week. You've been present with us, and we can anticipate your presence throughout the upcoming week and whatever plans we have. Thank you for you being with us in our lives. Thank you for the salvation we have in your Son, the Lord Jesus. We pray your blessing in this time of worship. Help us to sing the songs and that they would give voice to our praise within our hearts for your love. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Let's say hello to each other as we prepare to worship the Lord, and then we'll sing our opening hymn. Sing together our opening hymn, My Country, Tis of Thee. Here we go. Let's confess our sins together using the confession on the screen. Great God, eternal Lord, show us there is no law or liberty apart from you. And let us serve you wholeheartedly as your devoted followers. Draw us together as one people who do your will so that we may be a light to the nation, leading the way to your promised kingdom which is even now coming among us. Renew this nation through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord God, we do, 
confess our sin and national sin. Uh, there's components of national sin that's recognized in the scripture when you look back in the Old Testament, particularly with uh, your people Israel, how the prophets are constantly calling out the people collectively and, and challenging them to get right with you. And we pray that revival would come to our land and that you would renew people's hearts from the inside out. I remember a sermon illustration kind of image of a quilt and and the underside was all messed up and uh, or some kind of tapestry and then the flip side it was a picture of a human being when the human being is straightened out then everything else seems to take care of itself and we pray that you would help us as as human beings within our nation particularly as we celebrate our nation's birth that you would help us to come to know you that revival would sweep out from sea to shining sea and that it would begin, that revival would begin with us. And it's in your name that we pray, amen. Please be seated. I wanna read the scripture for this morning and I'm looking at uh, just a couple of verses from 2 Kings chapter 23, verses 21 to 25. This is the scripture, uh, 21, there we go. It says this, so King Josiah, right, I've been talking about King Josiah and all the, all the uh, challenging that he's been bringing to, to bear on the people, they're worshiping all these idols, that kind of thing. And then it says this, it says King Josiah then issued this order to all the people after he's done all this spiritual house cleaning. He says, you must celebrate the Passover to the Lord your God as required in this book of the covenant. There had not been a Passover celebration like that since the time when the judges ruled in Israel, nor throughout all the years of the kings of Israel and Judah. But in the 18th year of King Josiah's reign, this Passover was celebrated to the Lord in Jerusalem. Josiah also got rid of the mediums and psychics, the household gods, the idols, and every other detestable practice, both in Jerusalem and throughout the land of Judah. He did this in obedience to the laws written in the scroll that Hilkiah the priest had found in the Lord's temple. Never before had there been a king like Josiah who turned to the Lord with all his heart and soul and strength, obeying all the laws of Moses. And there has never been a king like him since. This ends the reading of God's holy word. We have an opening video. Check it out. All right, so I have this big rock out back. 
<laughs> Check it out, right? I, I, I know there wasn't a lot of activity in that video, but it was really interesting to watch. Like, when's this thing gonna split apart? A little work there, anybody think? A little work? Now, how did he get those spikes in in the first place? Incidentally, there were 23 steel things shoved into that rock before. Did he drill it first? And look at the ancient buildings. Think about the ancient buildings in the biblical period. Like, how did they, you, you were in Israel, how did they build those places? Like, that's how they built them. And then, Earl, can you give me a hand with this rock? <laughs> it's like, how did they do this? This is incredible, 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 and just persistent. My favorite part of that video, did anybody notice what he did one time? He, he's pounding this thing, pound, whoops, sorry. <laughs> he's pounding away at the, at the rock, and then at one point he steps back. Did you notice the shadow? He steps back, he looks at it, at one point he goes, that was work, right? That was, that was work, that was work. So this morning I want to talk about a guy that did a different type of work. I want to talk about King Josiah. And uh, the reason I liked, uh, there's a lot of reasons I liked that video, but one of the reasons I liked it was the 23 spikes representing 23 choices that we make in our life to, to, to go in God's direction, not, and the little bit, the persistence, the, the day in, day out, day in, day out, decisions to God's way has a big impact at the end of the game. That's, that's what I liked about that video. And I want to talk about Josiah. Review time. If you weren't here, there's all these kings in, in ancient Israel and Judah. There's two kingdoms. There's the northern kingdom that's Israel. Southern kingdom is Judah. And we're talking about the southern kingdom now. This is after King David and after King, after King Saul and David and Solomon and Rehoboam and Jeroboam, and it's going down the line. I'm not sure how far down the line, but eventually there's a guy that becomes king. His name is, is uh, Manasseh. And, and by this time, by this time, the people of Israel, they're supposed to be on God's side, but they've strayed away and they're worshiping all these other gods. Several of them on a read a little later in the scripture, but they're worshiping all these gods, false gods, prominent ones are Baal and Asherah, female, male gods of fertility, and they're into that. And that was really pumped up by this king named Manasseh, who's on the throne for 55 years. You can have a lot of impact when you reign for 55 years, right? So Manasseh's on the throne 55 years, then he dies, and his son follows, and his son's name is Ammon, A-M-O-N. And, and here's Here's what happens with Ammon. And I've referenced this before, but I'm reading it this time. It says, Josiah, whoops, wrong scripture, sorry. Ammon. Ammon followed the example of his father, who was Manasseh. <coughs> Ammon followed the fa example of his father, Manasseh, worshiping the same idols his father had worshiped. He abandoned the Lord, the God of his ancestors, and he refused to follow the Lord's ways. And then Ammon's own officials conspired against him and assassinated him in his palace. But the people of the land killed all those who had conspired against King Ammon and then made his son, and they made his son Josiah the next king. So what's going on? First of all, Manasseh been ruined for 55 years. Then Ammon comes into play. There's some palace intrigue. Don't fully understand all of this because not a lot of details are given, but Ammon's killed by some people, the cabinet members, whatever, and then some other group of people kills those assassins, and then Josiah takes the throne. And my question, as I'm reading this, I mean, this is interesting stuff, but when I'm reading this, I'm thinking, why is Josiah on the throne? Like, when I've read other scriptures, stories about kings wiping out other kings and stuff like that, and this kind of stuff going on, often they just wipe out the whole family. Why was Josiah allowed to continue to live? Why was he allowed to take the throne? Like, what was the motive there? What, was it a let's return to God motive, and that's who killed the other group? Or was it like they, they thought we can pull the strings of this king? Because how old was, do you remember how old Josiah was when he took, took the throne? He was eight years old, right? 
You can have a lot of influence over eight-year-olds. And not so much. I know that from experience. This weekend, we've had uh, three grandchildren at our house. I just heard my phone bing. That's the first time I ever heard that happen during a church service. At least they didn't call me. Uh, we had three grandchildren. One's four. She's the one you want to look out for. Can't watch your back. And then five-year-old. And then a seven-year-old, Ethan, seven years old. He, almost eight, right? Can you imagine Ethan being a king of a country? Like, are you eight, some eight-year-old in your life becoming king? This is mind-boggling to me. Now, why would the group that killed the assassins want Josiah to become king? Maybe he can pull his chains. Maybe he can do whatever. And here Josiah is. He's a little kid. Who do I trust? Who do I follow? Who do I allow to influence me? What understanding does he have about what it means to be king as an eight-year-old child, I don't know. All I know is that when we went to Heisler's yesterday with my three youngest grandchildren, you know, at one point they were talking, most of the time I was fooling around and joking and stuff like that, but which is an interesting picnic to go to Heisler's to play miniature golf with a seven and a five and a four-year-old. That's a story for another time, disaster zone city here. But anyway, Ethan at some point told us about the life story of, of of how it works, you live and da, 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 and then you die and then you go to be with Jesus. That's what he said. Now, how did, how did Ethan know that? Well, he was influenced by his parents. Well, what kind of influence did Josiah have? Well, the influence of his father, the influence of his grandfather, who's he most likely to worship? I would think Baal and Asher and that kind of thing. And yet, we know from the biblical story of last week that Eight years in the throne, now he was eight, and then plus eight is 16. When he's 16 years old, he turns his heart towards the Lord. Now, I don't know if that's surprising to the people that overthrew the father, killed him, or if it's not surprising, if it's pleasing to them or not pleasing to them, but he turns his heart towards the God of, the, uh, of King David, and then four years later, he begins to say, you know what? We need to splash, smash down some altars to these false gods. And then a discovery is made in the temple where they're doing some renovations when he's 26 years old. And in the renovation project, they encounter a scroll, right? I've talked about this before. They read it, and he's like convicted. He breaks down. He says, this is just terrible, the way we've been living. And he begins to really up his game in making these reforms. And, and here's a synopsis of some of the things he did. This is from the 23rd chapter of of uh, Second Kings, it says, Josiah tore down the altars that the kings of Judah had built on the palace roof above the upper roof of Ahaz. I'm just thinking, what's interesting to me about that is they had these altars to these false gods everywhere. Just everywhere. Not in just a prominent place. Everywhere. And the roof above the upper room of Ahaz. That's where one of these was. He tore that down and and it says altars. Actually, there's more than one, apparently. And then it says the king destroyed the altars that Manasseh had built in the two courtyards of the Lord's temple. Who's Manasseh? He's his grandfather. He tore them down. And he smashed them to bits and scattered the pieces in the Kidron Valley. Can you just picture that? I have my sledgehammer here. Can you picture him doing that? Right? He's smashing them up to bits. And he's scattering the pieces. And then the king also desecrated the pagan shrines east of Jerusalem. There's more shrines over there. To the south of the Mount of Corruption. I don't know why it was called the Mount of Corruption. I just think that's an interesting name for a place. Where King Solomon, he's my hero, King Solomon. Where King Solomon of Israel had built shrines for Ashtoreth, the detestable goddess of the Sidonians. See, this is what happens when you marry a thousand women. When you marry a thousand women, as Solomon did, for political expediency, we'll marry a woman from this, this nation, this nation, this nation, this nation, this nation. This is why God says you need to marry within the faith so that your own devotion to God remains firm. Otherwise, it's going to get diluted. Solomon's faith was very diluted. Here's what it says. It says, where King Solomon built shrines for Ashereth, the detestable goddess of the Sidonians, and for uh, Chemosh, the detestable god of the Moabites, and for Molech, the vile god of the Amorites. 
Josiah smashed the sacred alt pillars and cut down the Asherah poles. That's Asher, the goddess of fertility. And then he desecrated those places by scattering human bones over them. So this is what he's doing. Now here's my opening question. Which do you think was easier? The job that this guy was doing breaking that rock. You saw it. Pound, 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 and driving those spikes in the first place, which didn't make the cut in the video. Pound, pound, pound. Which was easier? Which would be an easier task to do? Which would you like to embark on? If you had to choose one, tearing, breaking big pillars or going into a nation which has been worshiping these false gods for generations of time and upsetting the apple cart and destroying all these altars and all these shrines all over the country of Judah, which would you choose? That's a no-brainer to think which is easier physically. I'd far prefer to tear down shrines physically than do, a, do the kind of masonry work that we saw breaking apart that stone. But if I had to make a choice, man, I'm, I'm going to be a stonemason. Because what he likely encountered, and we don't know all the details of this, but what he likely encountered, tearing down all these false gods and stuff like that, I'm sure there were times it got ugly. And uh, my representation of that, the reason I think that way is it depicted by a New Testament story, completely unrelated to Josiah, but just illustrates what some, what could have been in play when he tore down these altars. Here's, here's what happened. Again, New Testament, just a, a brief detour. Paul, the Apostle Paul, is witnessing for Christ in all, all these different places. And at one point, this, this person is creating a distraction. She's a slave girl to some people that own her, and she has the gift of predicting the future. Now, where did she get that ability to predict the future? See, I'm convinced that there's a gift of prophecy that comes from God, and I believe that Satan has a counter false, like alternative kind of thing. And I think, I do believe that psychics have the power to, to say some things. I do. I think that power comes from Satan. I believe there's demonic stuff involved in that. I really do believe that. And so here this woman is, she's predicting the future, and, there's, and she has this power by demons, and Paul at some point turns and prays and delivers her from the demonic presence of the Spirit. And now all of a sudden she doesn't have the ability to predict the future anymore. And guess what? She is a slave, which means she is owned by some people. And this is what the reaction of the people who owned her was. It says, her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered. So they grabbed Paul and Silas, dragged them before the authorities at the marketplace, and, and, and everything went crazy. See, the, the owners of this slave girl are ticked off. Now, let's go back on track with the story of today. Josiah is going all over Judah, and he's tearing down these altars to these false gods. Do you think anybody really cared? You better believe it. Let's just look at a couple of levels of care. One, the average person has been doing this for generations of time. This isn't just a new thing. And <laughs> knock on wood, <laughs> we don't want to jeopardize any. Remember, knock on wood, I talked about that a little last week. That, that practice of knock on wood, according to the source of all truth, the internet, suggests that maybe back in the day there was a belief that the spirits were contained within trees. So knock on wood, just in case, you know, that, these people, at this biblical period, for an extended period of time, believed that Baal and Asherah together tag-teamed and enabled them to have good rain for their crops. Now he's tearing this stuff down. He's getting the people that are in charge of the rain, the gods that are in charge of the rain and the soil and the fertility of the soil ticked off at us. What's going to happen to our future? I'm sure there was some level of fear on the part of the average person saying, what are you doing? You're angering the gods. So there's a religious objection to what's going on for sure that was across the land. And there was a financial objection. You know my daughter makes pottery, right? Do you know she sells her pottery? Well, there's artisans like that back in ancient days. And they're not just selling pottery. They are selling pottery. That's one of the things they do. They make tents. That's another occupation they had back then. But they also had people that made the idols. That was an industry. 
You had an idol manufacturing industry. You had people that did sculptures and sculpted out this massive God that we were going to worship. And, and it was an industry. There was money to be made. At the same time, if, if we were worshiping Baal or whatever the God was, Moloch was one of the gods that was mentioned, you know what? You could, for, for $5.95 or $29.95 plus shipping and handling, you can have your own little miniature Baal in your own bedroom and have your own shrine area. And if you act now, you can get two and we'll throw in a knife too. You know, they, they, that was, an, an, do, you th do you think, I mean, we're laughing because I'm making it funny, but do you think that happened? You better believe it. They had these home gods. They had these things. So now all this cottage industry of people that are making the home gods and making, and then the, the Michelangelo type of guys that are carving the big, uh, sculpting the big structure here that everybody's worshiping, all of those people are out of work. Remember what happened when the slave girl was delivered from her demon and how the masters felt about that? You got a lot of people ticked off at King Josiah. And you know what? They had the capacity to assassinate because we saw it in the case of their father. So you got, you got the average person saying, what are we going to do? There's not going to be any rain. The land's not going to be fertile anymore because we ticked off Baal and we ticked off Asherah. And then you got the people that are, are, are making these gods and goddesses. And then, remember last week, this blows my mind. They had temple, shrine, prostitutes, male and female prostitutes. Blows the mind. Like, it blows the mind that they had male and female prostitutes living in the temple supporting Asherah and Baal, and it's going on in the temple. You know what? We're now out of work, all of us prostitutes. He's got, he's got all kinds of people ticked off at him. So again, I would ask you, which would you rather do? Would you rather, would you rather be the stonemason? You want to get everybody in society out to get to you, knowing that you're living in a culture where assassinations are definitely in play, easily. Which would you want to do? This is what Josiah is doing. He's, he's turning the culture all upside down, and he's doing it because he feels called by God to do it. Not only are the average, uh, is the average persons mad at him, not just the guys that are sculpting the, 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 altar, the uh, idols and the people that are making the little pottery stuff at home, like my daughter Meredith, and not just the, the uh, prostitutes, the male and female prostitutes in the temple, but you know what? Who, who else is opposed to jo Josiah's reforms? Satan himself. Satan is ticked off. And when Satan attacks us, he does it in... Uh, material ways like, you know, using these other people to do opposition and probably there were attacks in Josiah's life that are not recorded in scripture. It's probably all that stuff's going on. But at the same time, Satan can play with our minds. Anybody here ever have attacks on your mind? And I become consumed with worry or consumed with fear and all of that stuff is going on. But Josiah sticks to his guns. Why? Because God spoke to him and said, you must. You must make these reforms, right? You've got, to, you've got to change things, right? You've got to change things. Last week I talked about how as, Eli uh, as Josiah got rid of the, the, uh, the shrines and the false gods and stuff like that society, I raised the question as to whether God would want you to remove, whether God would want you to eliminate anything from your life, right? And I asked you to write it down in these slips of paper. Do you remember that? I had the opening illustration be about decluttering. And then I talked about different activities. I just, I wrote some things down. I started the sermon last week and told you where it was going to end. And then I prayed that the Lord would speak to you. Because the issue is not what I say. The issue is not what I say here in the pulpit. As I'm just a human being. What matters is not what I say. Not what I say today, not what I say any week. What matters is what is the Holy Spirit saying to you while I'm speaking. That's what matters. And that's something you better not mess around with. That's something you better obey. Right? That's something I better obey. I could be preaching up here and the Holy Spirit says something to me. I better obey that. Well, that's what Josiah was doing. And, and so last week I asked the Holy Spirit to speak to you about stuff that maybe you should get rid of. And I, taught, I used some illustrations. Just get your, maybe God wants some of us to quit drinking. Quit drinking. 
Not that it's wrong to drink, but maybe somebody needs to quit drinking. Maybe somebody needs to quit smoking. Maybe somebody needs to stop chewing. Maybe somebody needs to stop looking at porn. Because it's prolific. It's prolific. Yeah, you know, I've talked to people who work in nursing homes. Men are looking at porn every day at nursing homes. Some, not all. Like it's prolific. It's just amazing. Maybe we need to eat better. That's a really silly thing. That's not, doesn't sound very spiritual, but the reason I mentioned that last week came to my mind is because I was at the Agape Festival that weekend, and one of the speakers on stage was 55 or something years old, and he said he used to joke about all the food he ate and make a big deal out of fried Oreo-type stuff, and then he had a heart attack, 12% chance of survival, and he survived by God's grace. And maybe, maybe God's whispering to you in your ears last week, you need to stop. You need to change the way you eat. Maybe you need to stop watching the news. As it's just playing into your worry and your worrying, and that honor is not God. Maybe, I said this randomly, it just came to my mind. Maybe I ought to stop riding a motorcycle. That's just, there's nothing wrong with a motor, motorcycle, but maybe God is just warning, would warn you last week. I talked about all these things just randomly. Maybe He's warning, maybe you really need to. I don't know. Maybe I threw in a crack about gaming. Maybe there's something about gaming. I don't even know what gaming is. Or maybe there's people, relationships should, you should break off. Uh, our attitudes, or approach to life. I've talked about all these different things, and the reason I talked about them is because, you see, Josiah has the ability to influence a nation, but you don't. I mean, you can vote, you can do little things, but there is one arena of the most significant area that you can influence. There is one thing that you can influence that's more than anything else. You know what that one thing is? One person you can influence more than anything else. You can influence you. Uh, years ago, I encountered this idea, you have circles of influence and circles of concern. And I might be concerned about this and that, and this and that, and this and that, and this and that going on in society. I'm concerned about all these things. And maybe I can do a little something around the fringes, around the edges to make a difference. But there is one area of influence that I can really impact. And that's the direction of my own life. That's why I was urging you last week, if you hear from the Lord, that you should make a change, that you should eliminate something from your life. And you hear it, not from me, not because I just mentioned a list of things, hey, you can change this or that, not because you heard it from me, but because you heard it from the Lord. You should change it. And you should begin to change it. Change it now, incrementally, incrementally. That's why I showed that opening video, because uh, there's these spikes, and they represent this choice, this choice, this choice this choice, this choice, through your life. And we need to make a series of choices that honor God throughout our life. And we don't need to look backward and say, I should have made this choice early. That's not, that's just a trick of the enemy. It's like today. Today is the day of decision. The scripture says today is the day to make a choice about which way you're going to go. And uh, sometimes the choice you make or God calls you to make goes against behaviors or practices in your own life even that have been well established. Like I look in the, I look in this biblical story and, and, and the thing that when I was studying it, looking at different aspects of it, the thing that blew my mind the most is how could they have temple prostitutes? Male and female prostitutes. Part of your worship experience was to engage in these prostitutes. How does that happen? Where the prostitutes lived in the temple. Like what, how far would we have to go before we have prostitutes living in this church? Like how do you do that? But it happened. It absolutely happened. How does that happen? I'm just thinking about it. And as my mind, my mind went down the path, I thought, you know, it's just incrementally, a little bit of a little bit, and everybody else says, this behavior is okay. Well, I guess if everybody else says this incremental behavior is okay, then it must be okay. And then this behavior is okay. This behavior is okay. This behavior is okay. Yeah, it's just incremental. It couldn't have been, hey, I got an idea. Let's bring some temple prostitutes in here. That wouldn't go over well. But maybe after 40 years of moving inch by inch by inch, yeah, maybe. I don't know. Just mind-boggling to me. 
I was just thinking about te temple prostitutes. There's, there's a lot of stuff. A lot of people talk about different sexual behaviors in our society. And often, sexual behaviors of others. Others. We, we really specialize in the sexual behaviors or the sins of others. I think primarily because it makes me feel more comfortable when I talk about your sin rather than my own. But I think to myself about that and about those prostitutes. And, and, and then I remembered a conversation. I'm putting this one time several years ago. I had a conversation with somebody about the history of their relationship. And in this setting, the individual said, we had to get married. What does that mean? We had to get married? Anybody know what that means when somebody says we had to get married? I bet you those of us who are older know right away what that means, right? You all know. Nod your head if you know what that means. Now, younger people, huh? You had to get married? I'm sure somebody's going to talk today. I'm going to talk to somebody today, and they're going to hear me. And they're going to say, what do you mean you had to get married? What does it mean if you have to get married? It means somebody's pregnant, right? And to do the decent thing, we, we got to get married. It's just, we had to get married. That's not true anymore, because we've shifted away from that. I've talked to young adults and that are wanting to get married. I just saw today. Yesterday, I think I saw somewhere on the internet, source of all truth. The, uh, there's the highest percentage of 40-year-olds, 40-year-olds in our culture than ever before who have never been married. Like, there's a rising number of people that have never been married. But anyway, we used to have to get married. And, uh, and now that, that idea is out the window. And I talk to people, young adults, who are Christians who are trying to wait until they are married to have sex. And they've told me it's very, very difficult to find somebody who shares the same standard. Very tough. Like one of the ways I can find somebody to marry is uh, online dating, right? A lot of people are doing that. I have no problem with that. But when you go online dating, I mean, everybody has different standards. You know, some, some people have a standard, you got to wait until at least your third date. Or at least until the third hour we're together. <laughs> it's the standard. And you laugh, that's the standard. And, and that's the standard. Now, how did it get that way? When I was a kid, a sexual behavior that was, I thought was supposed to be wrong was I wasn't supposed to look at Playboy magazines. Anybody remember Playboy? I don't think they publish Playboy magazines anymore. I don't think so. I don't know. They don't. So, certainly, um, they don't. And... Uh, why would I want to look at Playboy when it can look at a lot more vivid, vivid stuff online? Seriously. Um, I remember I wasn't supposed to look at Playboy magazine. I, I remember being exposed to Playboy magazine a couple of times. I, I was in geography class in Burnville in eighth grade. Some boys were looking at Playboy magazine in the back of the room. I remember in the counter behind me. And I, I didn't look at it. I remember being on a band trip with North Penn High School. We were in Indianapolis. We were staying in a hotel. And I was staying in a different room. And I came into another room. And there was a picture of a female on the, on the wall. And uh, I left. I remember that we were, you know, was, you weren't supposed to look at that. Now, we, we might, but we're not supposed to. You know what? Most of us in this room routinely look at pictures on movies now that are more vivid than would have been in a Playboy magazine years ago. Isn't that true? How did that happen? I don't know how that happens. I think it happens the same way you get temple prostitutes in the temple a bunch of years ago. Just a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, a little bit of erosion here and there and here and there and here and there, and, and eventually, I don't see anything wrong with temple prostitutes, do you? That's the culture. That's just the way it is. And yet here in the scripture, God is calling King Josiah to put himself out on a limb and condemn the worship of false gods. And it, it could result in his death. 
And so he goes about and he begins to make change. I don't think if any of you makes a choice, and I am not talking about sex today, it's just easy to illustrate, and it gets everybody listening a little bit better than some other illustrations I could use. Um, it could be anything. I'm quite sure that sex isn't the only sin that we can be guilty of, right? I'm quite sure that areas of sexuality is not the only arena in which there's a drift in terms of what God defines as right and what God defines as wrong. I tried not to last week when I was challenging you to pray to the Lord about an activity or a relationship, not to just put it in that arena. It could be in any area, but God calls us to make choices, little choices, one at a time, little choices. Now, I can feel guilty about what I've done in the past. This purpose, this purpose of the sermon is not to make anybody feel guilty about anything in the past. It's, it's to call us out, as Je Josiah was called out when he was confronted by the word of God, and say, you know what, this has to change. The question for us is, what has to change? And not in my life, that's for me to determine, as the Lord speaks to me. Not in the culture's life. I'm asking, what does God want to change about your life? Forget everybody else. What does God want to change about your life right now, going forward, here today? What does he want to change? Now, you won't get assassinated if you make that change. However, you will likely get some pushback. Jesus talks about that. Listen to what Jesus says about pushback. He says this in Luke chapter 12. He says, from now on, families will be split, split apart, three in favor of me and two against, or two in favor and three against. <clears throat> father will be divided against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. In other words, there's going to be pushback. And I don't think it's just in our families. It's like your childhood friend. What are you thinking? And sometimes people are offended by the change I'm making in my life because they're say, almost concluding that I want them to make a similar change. Hey, I'm not changing anything about you. I'm just changing me because God's telling me what to do. You have to answer the Lord for yourself. I'm not judging you. I just need to change. But you get all kinds of pushback. All kinds of pushback. I remember... Perspective of a child is a funny thing. It, it's very incomplete, likely somewhat inaccurate. But here's my childish perspective from when I was under the age of 10. I had an impression, just as I listened to my parents talk, um, my middle granddaughter for Aaron, she, Zoe, she has a reputation of being an eavesdropper. <laughs> she hears everything. She's proud of the fact that she's an eavesdropper. Well, I was an eavesdropper, too. I want to tell her that, but I was an eavesdropper. And I listen to my parents talk. And sometimes they talk, and I, I figured out, I'm pretty sure that most of my grandmother's siblings were alcoholics. I'm pretty sure my grandmother was an alcoholic, my mother's mother. I know that my grandmother fell down the stairs one time and broke her neck, and I think she fell down the stairs and broke her neck because she was drunk. I know my grandmother before I was born, or maybe early in my life before I knew anything, had a serious car accident, and it was caused by drinking and driving. I never saw my grandmother drunk, or if I did, I didn't know. She died of cirrhosis of the liver or pancreatic cancer, something that had something to do with drinking. Her siblings all drank, or most of them did, except for one, Ray. My mother's uncle, Ray. Ray was a Boy Scout. He was 80 years old and still a Boy Scout. The family joked a little bit. I think this was a friendly joke. He was the oldest Boy Scout in the United States. <laughs> He's into Boy Scouting. And you know what else Ray was? He was a solid Christian. He believed in Jesus. And you know what? Ray didn't drink. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to drink. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that it's wrong to drink to excess. It's wrong to get drunk. It's wrong. That's what Scripture says. But Ray... He didn't drink. And guess what Ray experienced? Mockery. Mockery. Nobody killed him. Nobody assassinated him. But he was mocked. I never heard it. 
I don't even know how many times. I think I remember being in Ray's house. I got a memory. I think I was in Ray's house one time. I think I saw him twice. I don't even know who he was. But I, I think he was mocked. Because I think in my eavesdropping skill set, I think I heard my parents say, Ray gets mocked. Well, guess what? Maybe you need to make a change. Don't let me tell you what change to make. Don't you dare listen to me. But you better listen to the Holy Spirit. Maybe the Holy Spirit wants you to change. And if you do, you probably won't get assassinated. But you might get mocked. And here's the challenge. You do it incrementally. You do it, you make one choice today, and then a couple of weeks or a couple of months or a couple of years from now, he calls you out to make another choice in your life. Make another decision. And, if, and it's not because I'm telling you, don't listen to me. Listen to the Holy Spirit. If he tells you, you need to make this change, even if nobody else agrees, whether it's, right, whether it's even in the realm of morality, if he tells you to make a change, you make a change. You listen to him. And you one by one make these decisions that makes a difference. So here's what happened. King Josiah put it all out in the line. Could have gotten killed. And King Josiah makes these decisions, and then at the end of all these, or, or at, an inter, at intermission time in his life and ministry, there's, there's something that happens. Listen to this. It's great. It says, King Josiah issued this order to all the people. You must celebrate the Passover to the Lord your God, as required in the Book of the Covenant. There had not been a Passover celebration like that since the time when the judges ruled in Israel. When the judges ruled in Israel, that was by my guess, and you know how accurate I am, but my guess, I think it's 400 years earlier. They hadn't had a Passover like this for 400 years, by my calculation. Since the time when the judges ruled in Israel, nor throughout all the years of the kings of Israel and Judah, but in the 18th year of King Josiah's reign, this Passover was celebrated to the Lord in Jerusalem. Was everybody happy? I don't know if everybody was happy. But I do know one person that was happy. You know who was happy? The Lord was happy. And you know what? Josiah felt the favor of God. And if you are faithful, I'm not telling you again what to do, but if you're faithful in doing what he wants you to do, one decision at a time, one day, you kind of come into his kingdom, and you're going to hear the Lord. You won't have a Passover, a Passover celebration necessary, but you'll have the favor of the Lord, and he'll say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. And you'll feel the warmth of God. And God will be blessed, and you'll be blessed, and it'll be a good moment, and it'll make it all worthwhile. So, here's the purpose of the sermon. I'm done with Josiah. You can read it for yourself, 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles. But here's the closing invitation, and that is to just let the Lord speak to you. Is there anything you should eliminate any change you should make, any decision you should make. And we're going to play that video one more time. And as we play it, let's just pr watch it with the spirit of prayer. Lord, with every hit, that sledgehammer, Lord, speak to me. What do you want me to change? What do you want me to do differently? As that's what it represents. One decision at a time in honoring God yields a life, results in a life well lived for him. Check it out. Here we go. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Lord God, I pray that you would help us to hear you speak. Everybody individually, myself included, help us to hear you speak. Is there any change you want us to make? in our relationship with others, in our behavior, in our attitude, in any realm of our life, reveal truth to us and help us to stand with you against the opinion of culture, our family, our friends. Help us to obey you and you alone and live a life that brings pleasure to your heart. Help us, Lord, for that courage and obedience. In your name we pray, amen. Let's continue to worship the Lord by singing Face to Face 684. This time let us express our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, who was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. Third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, sitteth in the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from thence it shall come the judge, the quick, and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Please be seated. 
want to have a moment of prayer together. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you again for this day, and we thank you for all the blessings of life. And uh, pray for those people that are in different types of need. Uh, one person in our church, Christian Perry, had a surgery this week, and uh, we pray that you would be with him in his recovery. Just uh, bring healing to him and help him to uh, do well in the aftermath of that. Thank you that it went perfectly well. We also pray for our country. We love our country and uh, just appreciate uh, the blessings of our country, its history, and, and, and yet at the same time we have concerns. There's different things that trouble us. We're certainly divided as a people and there's lots of things about our country that trouble us right now. And we, we lift them before you, Lord. We pray that your will would be done and that you would bring revival to our land we pray that if there's anything that we can do, that you would show us, that you would lead us by your Holy Spirit in doing whatever you want to serve your purposes because your kingdom lasts forever and is greater than any country in the planet. But we love our land and we pray your blessing on it in every way. Now here it says we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us when he said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. We forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This time, let's stand and sing our concluding hymn, Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory. <laughs>
Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore, world without end. Amen. May God.